my name is Asa Center Trevor Williams, and I'm a second year MFA student at Maryland Institute College of Art, and also the artist in residence at Campbellsville University. Hi, my name is Matthew Hodge. I'm on faculty at Campbellsville University teaching music and theater. And along with Dr. Frida Gbert, we're going to be presenting The Sound of Color for the 9th International Conference for the Arts and Society. As an artist, I use photography extensively in my practice. In the last several years, I started evaluating how I use photography. Um, it began as a journalistic process, um, and in a sense, it's still that way, but I use journalism, uh, photography in this sense, to be a little bit more personal. I use it to establish a time uh, marker of space of emotion. So to the average person, sometimes the images that I take on an everyday, um, in an everyday practice don't have a lot of weight or don't have a lot to really indicate because the emotion to me is the what is triggered. Um, and so I wanted, I started to explore how I could share that. And is there an underlying content between the surface of the photograph in which I can share that? Is it within its DNA of the photograph? Um, for, for me to be able to explore. And in that sense, um, I began thinking about um, uh, these images that were very personal in nature, um, but I don't necessarily want to disclose the image as it is. It's very revealing, it could be revealing, a lot of questions could come out of it and why I selected those images. And in that essence, I wanted to um, just keep that to myself. Um, but how do I take an image and translate it for the audience to be able to um, share that emotion or that um, uh, timer marker as well? And so I started thinking about why do I want to keep these hidden? And so this theme of secrets started coming up. And how do I create something tangible out of something that we know exists but is hard to prove? Um, and so I started thinking about if we use photographs to regain a memory, uh, can feeling be fully restored in a two-dimensional plane? So that was a really important question that I grappled with quite a bit. Um, and what other senses can be utilized to aid in regaining that memory or that, or that secret? And so, you know, they say um, scent is one of those things that um, really takes you back. Um, to a, a location or a person or whatnot. Um, and so I started thinking about sound. Um, and so for me, sound is very important as well. I really um, generate a relationship with sound. Um, and so I can actually place things according to um, uh, music and whatnot. And so um, how can someone, how can I uh, think of ways to have someone share that experience? Um, and so I really thought about um, what it would be like um, to share the reality of the image or what the true essence of it without revealing it. Um, can I shelter? Is it possible for me to shelter the truth behind it uh, and transform the content in the surface of the image so that someone can experience it? Um, that was really big. And um, one of the biggest things is to keep that um, really to myself. So ultimately, through this whole process, uh, that was a that was very important. I wanted to um, be the only person that actually has access or the thoughts or the memory behind the selection process and what the content of the original image is. Um, I will show you in the process of how I got to that point. Um, and that was one of the things that Matt really um, was on board with, is that you can't revert that. Uh, I will be the only one that would have that information. Um, which is part of the essence of it being a secret, being um, my emotion to begin with. But I wanted to show either the hurt or the enjoyment or the frustration or the contemplation or the chaos behind it um, and to make sense of it. And so the whole essence of it is to create a system um, so that way I could pull away my emotion and actually achieve uh, a piece of work uh, through um, our parameters uh, as two different artists collaborating into one. Um, and that was um, one of the biggest challenges, but also um, uh, seeing if my emotion 
from the original image would be conveyed. So there's a little bit of systematic um, uh, parameters that are being placed, but also in the end, there's some human nature. Um, we can't get away from this, um, these choosings, these choices that we make as humans, as aesthetic, as, as um, visually or audibly uh, in the process. So there's really, there really isn't a way um, ultimately to get away from that experience because ultimately it is a memory. So uh, we'll be showing you later on our process um, from beginning to end of how we collaborated in this project of the Sound of Color. When I started this process, I selected an image. Um, for, this is a sample. This is not one that I would use, but it had some emotion behind it. Um, so this picture, let's say, you know, there's a timestamp on it. You know, it says 725. Um, that could be relevant. The location could be relevant. The time of year could be relevant. Um, but it's something that gives emotion. Um, you know, I suspect that at some point I'll use images with people in them and whatnot. So this is just an example, but. Um, from the process, I selected the pointillism filter um, in Photoshop to create colorful cell structures to protect the integrity of the image. Um, and that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to keep the image, um, have a representation of it rather than show you um, the reality of what the image is. And so the filter group there, the filter groups similar pixel, pixels together based on the color values from the original image and they interpret them into the cell structures. The cells can be um, adjusted from a three, which this is just its, its system, um, the three size, all the way to 300. And once a number or a cell size is selected, it's unique to that moment. So as you can see here, um, you know, let's just say that there's a maroon and a dark gray here at the bottom. And so once the slider is moved away from that position um, and is repositioned back to it, you can see that those um, configuration has changed. And um, at first we wanted to do a, a process in which it was very um, non-emotional. The emotion was taken away from it. Me as the creator and as the artist um, would not have, um, you know, it was more systematic. And in this process, um, I have to make some choices. And so at this point, I have to make the choice uh, at the moment, allowing uh, the selection process to be unique uh, based on the aesthetic. So I just shifted um, and I looked for something that um, created the mood, um, the spacing between the cell structures, how did it flow, um, was the image this representation, um, did it describe what I was feeling, uh, why I selected the image? And so that was really important to me to be able to select that. Um, and so say I wanted 255, um, I would go ahead and hit OK, and it would transform the image um, into uh, its configuration based on the pointillism. So um, to me, that that's well balanced, the colors, um, and the balance and the juxtaposition between the, the darks here and the light and the spacing between it. Um, that's important to me. Um, so say I selected this one. Um, so here you can actually see the original image still here and, um, it has now changed in the background to the pointillism. Um, and so I want to emphasize that um, at this point, you could revert back to the original image. Um, so once you save as, and let's just say um, uh, conference sample, um, once I save as, um, the image is still right there, but say I close it. And I'm going to reopen. There it is. That original image is now gone. So there's no way for you um, to be able to re-evaluate uh, or take that image and reverse it back. So the only person that is actually going to know what the image is is going to be myself. Um, there is no plan for me to share. 
what the original image is. Uh, it is neat to know and for the image to actually um, and the sounds that I wanted out of it to be um, uh, recon like restructured and reconvened into a different medium. So um, I want the music and the visual aesthetic um, to actually show what my emotion is. And this is the image that is the actual uh, piece of art. Um, this is the one that um, will never be revealed, to, uh, what the original image is. And um, this is what I brought to Matt. Um, I said, this is, this is my process. This is where I'm going with it. Um, what I want to convey is the emotion. So what if I create a system in which this image um, – creates a sound, creates a mood. How can I share what I want to feel? As you saw before in the picture of the, of the clock tower, so that feeling may not, um, you know, transmit to you exactly the mood that I was feeling. So how can I, is there an underlying um, content to an image that can actually relay emotion? Um, so that was the whole beginning of the project. So what I did was I divided the image into two by two um, a graph and use that as a guide. So I decided that I would go uh, row by row. Um, and so I read it from left to right, um, top to bottom. And as you can see, there's an overlap in the cells themselves here. So how do you, how do I create sound? You know, um, I thought about, um, uh, music, uh, sheet music, and you read it from left to right. So that was the beginning process. Um, what about the, the notes that are happening right here? How, you know, can those, or I'm sorry, the cell structures, those two cell structures, can they create a noise? Can they create a sound with those two colors? Can they represent uh, a notation and those two notes, can they be played at the same time? I left white to be no sound. So it's just white sound. Um, and here you can see three uh, collab three notations, three cells that are going to be notations uh, that will be played at the same time. So this is what I brought to Matt. Um, and from there, we um, decided to come up with a system um, between both of us of what we need visually and also what we need um, audibly. So when Asu Sina approached me uh, about the project, I found it to be really fascinating and found it uh, something I could connect to because in the music world and the music mediums that I work in, um, on a daily basis, I'm constantly working with technology in ways that sometimes is a hot debate within the music world about um, at what point does technology take away the soul of music or can technology be used um, without humans and does that does it have an effect on the organic process? Um, so the best way I thought about having us move forward with the project and being able to identify how we're going to have a common language of music is to use what's called the scientific pitch notation. Um, it's also can be called the American standard pitch notation, but I prefer scientific pitch notation. In the music world, it's just a way to be able to label pitches. Um, so. That's a scale in the music world, and each of those notes has a specific pitch name and number in the scientific pitch notation system. Um, it's used mainly in the western part of the world, um, where America is in, so it's not the same notation system that's used in other parts of the world, but in our music industry, it's what's considered common. Uh, so the way you start out by doing it is you have to be able to find um, a specific a letter number, a letter name, and a number to assign colors. And so I was told that as you said, I would be able to transform a picture and to be able to for it to create these cells that have colors in them. And so we sat and we talked and figured out what numbers should we work with, what parameters do we have to work within. And so we came up with the number seven for how many different colors. Uh, we would use, and I'll let her explain later how we came up with that number. But actually, seven worked really well for my end too, because in this pitch notation system in Western Western American music, seven is the number of pitches on a scale. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So it worked out perfectly for me. It's what is called a diatonic scale. 
Um, and so then the other thing we had to determine is the octave number, which is where a number comes from. So in this pitch notation system, C, which is one of the notes that you have to work with, C is sort of the foundation, the gravity, if you will. And so in this system, there are 10 different Cs, and they're labeled from, Z, from C0 all the way up to C9. Middle C, if you've ever heard of that on piano, there's a, a specific key on the piano called middle C, and it's in the middle of the piano. It's where when you learn piano, that's sort of the, the foundation where you start at. Middle C in this notation is called C4. So that means it's the actual, um, the fifth C in the notation system. Um, in uh, middle C can be called other numbers. For example, in MIDI software that I'm actually going to show you later on. In MIDI software, middle C can be called C3 or C5. But in this notation uh, system we're working in, we use C4. So in order to determine how to take one of these color cells and to create a number and a letter, we came up with an organization and kind of a chart way to do it. So what I told her was, um, because we had seven different pitches, with um, or seven different pitches equals seven different colors, within each color, you're gonna have to have different shades of that color. And we also came up with the number seven for that. So seven different colors and seven different shades for each color. And what that would translate to music-wise is that that also gives us seven different octaves it can be. So even though a piano keyboard has more octaves than that, that gave us seven, which is a good number and it lets us work within the octaves on a piano or keyboard that quote unquote sound good. It takes away the extreme low ends and the extreme high ends. Um, so the specific color I told her would, uh, would symbolize what pitch, which of the seven pitches on the diatonic scale it would uh, symbolize, and then what shade would determine which octave it would be. So if it was the second lightest shade, it would be um, the second from the top octave. We went from uh, dark shades to light shades, the way that sound also goes from a dark sound to a light sound. thought that would be easy. So she was to take each cell and to create a number and a letter that could go uh, that she could give me. If cells were what I would call connecting or touching in certain ways or organized in certain ways that they were kind of together, then I said you can put those pitches together at the same time. Uh, and that would also give us harmony. So that would mean something like where different notes are played at the same time. So it gives us both vertical harmony and horizontal melody, which is what most music is built around. Um, so we actually uh, helped her create this chart. So in order how to draw a keyboard properly, and I helped her learn that she would be able to label properly. So I helped her draw a piano keyboard, very basic. And then at the bottom, we have I helped her label the numbers and letters. So we would know kind of what we were working with. And so each cell, depending on what color it is and what shade of color she determined it to be, it would go with one of these pitches. So this is sort of our rough draft of kind of how to begin, uh, how to have a common language. So I will say, um, if there is a negative side to it, that it is working within parameters. And so the problem is people could argue that um, you still have a lot of control over what's happening and there's not a lot of free imp improvisation with it because you're, by limiting it to the diatonic scale, specifically the C major scale, I gave her the pitches of C, D, E, F, G, A, B, which is a C quote unquote C scale, C major scale, it is limiting her to a specific key signature, either C major or A minor. Um, but the issue with that is that no matter what we did music wise, there's always gonna be some kind of parameters. If I gave her more shades and more colors to work with, I could give her more pitches on a piano and go into chromatic pitches. Um, chromatic means half steps. 
which gives you more pitches within a scale. Um, but even that still has parameters, because then the, in, in the middle of chromatic sense, you have microtones, which is what's used in other parts of the world. So no matter where we ended up with, there's always going to be a box. So there's no way to, to possibly make it happen where there's absolutely no human box to trap the music into that's going to happen. So for the first time around, I thought a diatonic scale would be the best way to do it. It does create a more tonal sound. Tonal means it's a little orally more pleasing to the ear. But even within a tonal diatonic scale, you can still have lots of Im improvisation. And you never know if it's going to have a more major sound or a minor sound, depending on the order of the pitches. Um, what octaves it's going to be in, what the leaps could be, what dissonance could happen. Dissonance is when tones can clash, or versus consonants when the tones can sound pretty together. Um, so it was still really interesting to figure out what the outcome would be. And I would have no idea, even by looking at a list of pitches, what the outcome would be until it's plugged in. Um, so once I helped her establish this common language, I left her alone. Um, and I knew that I would be receiving back from her a list of pitches in the way that I had her label them, and then I would go from there. With working with Matt, we discussed what each of us would need um, as artists and what our parameters would be. What is our minimum? What's our maximum? Either sound, not notes, um, keys on a keyboard, my color choices. Um, and so I tried to create a system in which this is what I ended up with. With Matt, we um, discussed that we would need seven notes. He had his reasoning behind, as he explains uh, in this presentation, of why uh, seven would be a good number for uh, music notation. Uh, for me, it's a basic minimum. Um, uh, I have sec uh, primary and secondary colors, and then I also have black. White on, I decided that white on um, the original image was just going to be noise, so white noise. Um, and so these were my minimum, and the tone, the different tonalities in the colors really wasn't as relevant. I needed to have some differentiation between the lights and the darks. Um, and so really Matt set that number um, based on what he needed um, and the variations that would possibly happen within the image. Um, and so from here we decided that um, C would be on the left, um, indicating a darker tone, and the B, um, A and B's over on the right hand side, which would be the lighter tones. And um, the darker tones within the colors would be at the lower bottom and the darker. So I would take this image or take the original image and I would evaluate the colors. I wanted it to be very systematic. I didn't want to have um, originally very uh, a selection or choices that I would have to make as the person that would be the only one that would know what the original image is. Um, but quickly I had to make choices um, because this color chart isn't as varied. It's not every single color of the world. Um, it is not like a Photoshop color picker where I can select everything. Um, and so there had to be some parameters and choices that needed to be made. Um, but what I did do is if I saw a color that was very similar from one place to another from here to there, I would make notations and make sure that those two sounds would be um, consistent. Um, and from there, I had to make choices, like where does the dark blue um, here uh, fall into place um, in, in between here. These pink tonalities here, um, it's very hard to distinguish between the top ones right there. So, um, you know, where do these fall in? And from there, I um, um, gave Matt the, the notes. So as you can see, the, um, the notes are written on there for a quick reference for myself. Um, and because it was my choosing and it was most of my project, um, I would, uh, I'm going to be giving Matt a list of notations. So which two notes are going to be played at the same time in this, at the same time, um, not only audibly, uh, but also um, visually across the screen. So this is a time duration 
both in, in visual and in music. So these two notes here. And then I would differentiate them uh, by using a comma. So I gave Matt this notation. So these two notes here, um, the slash means that I wanted those two, those several notes or those notes, um, so everybody had a slash, to be played at the same time. And then the comma was differentiating between the space and time. So it's, it's the actual grid space. So as you can see, you're actually reading from left to right uh, what the note would be. Uh, in here. So it's spread left to right, top to bottom, across the screen. Um, and that's what I would hand over to Matt. And he would take over and input that into his system. So the next step for me in this process was when Asusana sent me this, which was a chart of the pitches that, um, based on the colors and shade of each color of the cells, that she found created this chart. You can see here an example of when we establish how multiple cells would be together, that there would be a line, which would also mean that these two pitches would be played at the same time, which would also create harmony. And so I was to read the chart like the way I would uh, normally read language. So from left to right and from the top to the bottom. So what I did is I took each pitch and I hand put them into this. This is a program called Sibelius. It is an example of a software for music notation to write sheet music. So this is what the pitches looked like once I inputted them in. Things like this, where there are multiple notes at the same time, that's when there were two pitches with a line between them. Um, due to the complexity of the distance between the pitches, um, I had to input them manually, uh, which means I typed them in instead of playing them on a keyboard with my own hands um, actually performing the piece as a piano piece because we didn't want any limitations based on the distances between the pitches, so there were a couple of times that a large clunker of notes would just be physically impossible for two hands to play at the same time. So after I did this, and this created my sheet music for it, then what I did is I exported this as a MIDI file. MIDI is one way that you can export uh, sheet music as uh, a computer program. MIDI stands for Musical Instrument Digital Interference. And so it's a kind of computer file. So then I exported the MIDI file and I opened it in this other program called Logic. This is an example of what's called a DAW, a D-A-W, which stands for a Digital Audio Workstation. It's programs where music is produced, mixed, mastered. Um, when you record music, it's usually into a DAW program, a D-A-W. So when I exported the MIDI file, it actually turns it in to something that looks like this. It looks like a math chart. I can look at it as sheet music, as you see here, but I actually prefer to look at it as this way. So as you can see here, there's a keyboard here on the side and each of these squares and rectangles have a specific color, a specific length, and they're on a pitch. It's, this is another way of using technology in a different notation system for music. As you see, there are different shades of colors on the blocks. There's different greens and blues. And if you look, as I click on a note over here on this list, it gets highlighted. This column right here, all these different numbers represent the intensity of the note, how hard the note is played. So each of these notes have different levels of intensity or how hard the note is hit. That gives it a much more human feel. If all of these numbers matched and they were all the exact same number, it would have a very robotic, uh, technology sound and not mimic the sound of a live piano. So just to play you a small sample of it, this is what it plays like in this program.
So another thing I did too with this program is in music you use technology to what's called max. Uh, I'm sorry, to mix and master and edit music to give it a nice uh, published broadcast sound. So all of these highlighted boxes are just random things that you do as part of mixing and mastering. It deals with how loud the music goes, um, where does the sound peak at, the reverb of the song. In essence, what does the song sound like? So I mixed and mastered all of this um, and just made it, I added reverb and tried to just have it a nice polished sound as if it was an album or a CD recording. So then, once this was done, and I used this program to make a nice polished sound, I then export, I exported the song out of the program as an MP3, as a normal audio file that you will now hear in a second. So I used both this Logic program, which is once again a DAW, a digital audio workstation, and this program, Sibelius, as a music notation software, to take the pitches in this chart and use technology in ways that are advanced in notating music and producing the sound of music in a way to create a natural sounding, realistic human sound of the piano playing this, even though it was formed within technology. And so now you will get to hear um, a small 20 30 seconds of the track actual track so here we go So now we have the results of the actual photographic melody along with the first stages of the visual. So Matt, at this point, as a composer and as a musician, what is the feeling or what mood does the actual photographic melody set for you? Yeah, well it's interesting because one of the things that I've, I was most fascinated at the beginning was when you told me that no one will ever know what the picture is because you can't, whatever process you did, you can't Person. So and you never told me, so I still have no idea what the picture is. Um, so I get to interpret it like the audience will. All I saw were color cells. Um, so for me as a musician, I really enjoyed the music outcome. Um, for me, I remember when you first asked me, I used the word uh, bittersweet. Um, the music, in my opinion, seemed to have, it wasn't completely tragic, but there was weight and depthness and a bit of hauntingness to the sound beneath the, uh, the light and positiveness of it. Um, that was sort of my music impression. And if I was told to, you know, at a job, write something bittersweet, it would sound like that. And so that was sort of my country of it. So as an audience, when I was trying to picture, well, what is the picture, um, the <laughs> photograph that you used, it, I imagine it to be something like that, something that's a sweet memory, but yet has more of a hauntingness to it, something below the surface. So that's what I thought it was. <laughs> was I accurate? Yes, actually, um, what I felt, what I initially felt from it um, was um, a little bit of complexity, a little bit of darkness, um, but I wanted it to have these happy moments because the actual secret or memory that is originated from um, has that. It's very complicated. Um, it has some depth to it. It has this kind of tragedy to it because it can't, you know, it, it's very complex and so it kind of bounces back and forth. And sometimes within the same cell, you can hear the dark and the lightness hit at the same time. And so I wanted that to show that although, you know, whatever the image is, at times it was could be nice, could be wonderful, but then it, you know, it can't happen or whatever. You know, obviously, I'm not going to interpret and tell you exactly what the image is, yeah. but um, I wanted that to actually show. So it's, for me to hear that back from you is actually telling that this process is working, and having the system and parameters actually works for the image. So at this point in time, 
yes, you know, this is this is exactly the route that I wanted. Great. So for the first time doing this, it was a success. Right. Uh, so what is the next step? Because I know when you talk about the project, you always talk about it in the terms of it's not final yet. I know my part for this particular piece is done, the music's done. Right. Um, but is there other things, other steps you're going to employ? Right. At this point, what I consider um, our process thus far is more kind of a research and getting the outcome. So what we have now is, is the stepping stones into going um, and for me to actually work in my artistic sense. So um, I've started working with um, technology and working with software to actually have something um, come out of it. I don't exactly want just the cell structures as an image to be on a wall with the sound going. I wanted to interweave a little bit more. So I'm working with it. I do have um, kind of my, I call my sketches at this point, so I'm working with technology, I'm gonna be furthering it, but at this point it's not complete, you know, it's not gallery ready, let's say, um, but um, this is the research portion of it, and it's actually it has been successful for me to continue going, and that this is actually coming to fruition. Great, well it'll be exciting to do this again. Yeah. Another photograph, so we're gonna end the video with um, letting you hear the entire piece in its entirety. The piece is about approximately two minutes and 45 seconds, and we'll just play it over the top of the image, um, not the actual photograph, but the image that was transformed. And thank you all so much for watching. Okay, thank you.